when I began taking care of myself in all five areas, my bucket became so full and I began sleeping six hours a day. And when people would come in and talk to me at work and I would participate, my mind was clear. I was better. I was sharper. I didn't give up anything. By taking time for me, I blew up. I became this amazing person. The goal of the Best You Podcast is to allow you to feel confident about what you need to do, why you need to do it, and how to do it in order to get closer and closer to your best you. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast. Today, I am super stoked to be joined by the one and only Mary Crafts. Mary, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure. I'm so excited to be here because isn't that what we're all about, being our best possible selves? Amen to that. Amen to that. So I had the pleasure of being introduced to Mary a few weeks ago now through our uh, our mutual friend, Scott Miller. And uh, we connected and hit it off pretty immediately. And, and me hearing her story, I was very enthused about her transformation that she's undergone over the last couple of decades. And I'm super excited for her and her book launch that she, at the time of this recording, is now, uh, the book is launching this week. And tomorrow, is that what you said? Tomorrow, yes, October twenty eighth. Let's go, let's go. So you guys, first off, need to go get her book, Unbounded from Sorrow to Summit, but you also need to make sure that you listen to her story and you listen to everything that she's going to motivate you with and the uh, information that she's going to provide you with today because it will spark you to want to go get the book as well. But Mary, I kind of want to start off with a little bit of your story, and I feel like from reading a little bit of your book, there's a few different pivotal moments in your life that really sparked you to seek some transformation. And one of them I know was you seeing that picture of yourself on your 50th birthday party and being like, who is this lady? I never thought that I would become this person. There was another one of you climbing a bridge with your family. And that seemed like a kind of a huge transformational moment for you. And then also maybe talking to uh, your therapist with with your ex-husband around that situation and like kind of different lanes that your life could go down. And so basically the way, the reason why I'm bringing up some of these transformational moments is what do you think it takes for a moment to be transformational for somebody? Like what, why those moments, what, why did those moments spark you to want to create a change in your life? I always say that change happens when the why becomes more important than the fear. And we have a lot of fear around changing. Uh, We don't know what it's like on the other side. And we continually, I continue to tell myself that that change was not possible, that it was beyond me, that this was my lane. I was just stuck in this lane. But when my why for changing became so huge, I could no longer deny it anymore. Then change begins to happen. And my why for changing was I wanted a different life than the one I had. And I wanted it to the point that I was willing to take accountability for where I was. I couldn't play victim anymore. And the great news about being accountable for where you are is that you can what? You can change it. And as Mm -hmm. long as you're a victim, there's no change possible. So when I finally took accountability, this was not my husband's fault. This was not my parents' fault. This was not my circumstances' fault. This is not my genetics' fault. It's no one's fault, but it's a it's a situation, an opportunity that I walked into for growth. I believe that I chose these situations in my life and that I could be accountable and change them. And I think that's why people change um, mm-hmm. is because they make a decision at one point that they're going to take accountability. And then what are the steps? You can't change without a strategy. You can't just say, oh, I want to change. I'm going to change. (laughs) And then just like, you know, the fairy godmother with her wand, you get to change. You have to have a strategy. And I laid out a strategy for me. And I began through that process. And more than anything else, I was committed to get through mm-hmm. and not around my fears. I love it. I love it. What a what a great way to 
start off and get everybody fired up right away. So I think there's a, f- a number of different things. You know, you, you mentioned needing a strategy for change. And so a few different things that you did really well was you set realistic goals and stepping stones. You know, you originally back when you were 284 pounds, you set the goal of losing 20 pounds to 264. And that was that was the only thing that you were focused on. You were focused on getting there. And the other thing that you did, I'm not sure exactly if you had done it at that early stage or a little bit later on, but I know you hired a trainer. And so always having a professional around us, both to provide us with the education of exactly what we should be doing and helping you define the strategy, but also there for support and accountability is is key. So those are really two key things that I think you did a really great job of in your strategy. But inevitably, there I'm sure were times when you may miss some workouts or you did not eat the right food that you maybe should have eaten. So what do you think allowed you to bounce back during times when maybe you fell short of executing on your strategy? Every one of us has seen yo-yo dieters. And I was one of them for 50 years where you can stay committed to a diet and you do that for a while, but then it's hard and you, you just give up on yourself and you gain it all back. And maybe you've lost it all, or maybe you've just lost part of it. But until we actually step in to the reasons behind our situation and the fears that we hold, change cannot be permanent because if I was using protectionism to, for me to carry that weight, unless I dealt with my fears, I was going to just keep putting that protectionism back in place. And that for me was the one difference between where I had been in the first 50 years and where I've been in the 19 years since that. I have not gone back. I'm 19 years in this phase of my life, being my best me. And I'm not going back because that was a big commitment for me to change and to look at each one of those fears. I just made lists. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? You know, uh, And I began to note what I was physically feeling when those fears were coming. I was feeling like maybe I was feeling my heart pounding, or maybe I felt my palms sweating, or maybe I felt like, but you need something to eat. (laughs) That trigger, when I would think to myself, oh, about food and about eating, I knew it was because a fear was presenting itself for me. And rather than looking and dealing with the fear, I found another way to self-soothe, to self-medicate. And when I began to see that pattern and keeping a journal about those things, then I began to see, okay, this is what I need to look at. And what was the fear here? And what could I choose instead? So I created an actual strategy for that change and and how to track those fears. What were some of the different lists of fears that you wrote down? Well, originally they were things like uh, a fear of rejection, like why I never could go bring myself to walk into a networking event. I would arrive, I would drive around the block again and again, you know, And then sometimes I would go in, but most of the time I went home because I was afraid that I would be laughed at or people would say, oh, look, she's here by herself. She doesn't know anyone. No one wants to talk to her. Oh, look, we all have dresses on and she has pants or vice versa or whatever the heck it was with those fears. Um, And fear of failure was a big one for me. I was so afraid of failing. Uh, that's why I was such a great caterer for mm-hmm. for 35 years. I did that. And I was great at it because I was such a pleaser. I was like, you need this. Oh, I'll do that. Or I'm over here. And, I'm over and crazy lifestyle, crazy way to live a life. When I began to change those motivations at age 50, the last 15 years of my career was drastically different. Mm-hmm. I began catering out of love instead of fear. I loved my clients. I wanted to serve them. I wanted to be there for them. For my staff, I wasn't trying to manipulate them to get them to stay and want to be with me. I was reaching out to them in love. And I wanted to be there for a whole different reason. It not only transformed me, but my team, my clients, 
And one of the biggest event, biggest things that I remember very well, a client saying to me, this was after a big event and I had been very active in the room, walking around, talking about the food, where it was sourced, sourced from, how we were eating it and blah, blah, blah. And he called me over and he said, Mary, I've eaten around the world. And he said, this is probably one of the best meals I've ever had. And I was beaming, of course. But then he went on to say, but a year from now, I'm not going to remember what I ate. But I'm never going to forget how I felt. And when I talk to business groups and I talk to them about the use of love in their businesses, they're like, oh, wait a minute. This is not appropriate here in this you know, genre. Uh, we don't talk right. about love. <laughs> we talk about profit margins. We talk about team culture. We talk about, I'm like, what if you inserted love into all of that? How would you and your company be transformed? And so that's one of the big keys that I used as my strategy. I would ask myself at every point, is this motivated by fear or is it motivated by love? Mm. And the one thing I learned about all those fears that I just listed is they all boil down to one. And this is the fear that every one of us have to face and deal with in this life. And that is the fear of not being enough. And I've been in front of a group of men before and talked about physical struggles and all sorts of things. And they all just kind of sit there with this confused look on their face like, oh, huh. I remember finally one guy raised his hand and he said, oh, I think I get what you're talking about. I think my wife feels like that. <laughs> and I said, your wife? Okay, well, that's good. That's good. Yeah, she's had those struggles. I go, okay, but you yourself, you you don't have fears. And he said, well, no, not like that. I don't have any fears. And I said, so you've never been afraid you were going to be passed over for a promotion? Oh, yeah, well, that's not really fear. That's, you know, that's just, you know, normal. I go, okay, at least you've accepted it as normal. Why would you be passed over? Are you afraid you're not enough? And they kind of like really don't want to look at that piece. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm like, were you ever afraid you, you weren't going to make your mortgage? Were you ever afraid that you were going to be a bad dad? And your kids weren't going to stay close to you? Those are fears. And they all yeah. boil down to the same fear. The fear of not being enough. And so I feel like with a lot of people, it's trying to figure out how the fear of not being enough manifests itself in each of our lives and then trying to find a way to specifically confront it. How, like, how do you, how do you practically find ways to strategically confront the fears that you have? Because I mean, I feel like, you know, for you, I think one of the, a great example is you obviously doing a lot of the, the, mountain climbs or a lot of hiking and stuff. And I know one of the last things that I read is you setting a goal to hike this mountain in September and you train for it. And then you looked outside and it was, it was it had snowed that day and you're like, Oh my gosh, I, I, I can't do this. It snowed. And then you ended up going anyways, but how do we strategically identify the fear and then try to confront it afterwards? I took a post-it note. And I put this on my bathroom mirror and it stayed up there. I mean, I had to sometimes change it because it got pretty tattered looking, but it stayed up there for over. Y'all get ready to write this down. Y'all get ready to write this down. This is big. This is big. And I asked myself every morning, what would I do today if I wasn't afraid? That question alone was, it was in charge it was changing my life on a daily basis. I would think through my day. I would think of maybe this chamber event I was supposed to go to. And I'd think, what would I do today if I if I weren't afraid? And I would strategize. Like, I would get there. I would park. And I would go in. And I began to visualize it. And I would say, and rather than just waiting around for somebody to talk to me, I'd walk up to them. What a novel idea. And I would say, um, so this is my first time. Uh, do you, is there a registration? Do I? I see you have a name tag. Where do I get that? Uh, and what happens here? Do we just mingle the whole time? Is there, is there a program? I would initiate conversation. And suddenly I had a best friend. 
because nine times out of 10, they go, this is my first time too. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, um, okay, great. Well, let's go over to the registration table. And I would plan out those things that were coming up in my life that I knew there was fear. And where before I had sometimes not stepped up and think, what would I do today? What if let's just pretend? What would I do today if I weren't afraid? And when the I think that, I think the thing that I love so much about the question is it simultaneously does the does the two steps of I kind of identifying what you're afraid of and then giving you an action step to confront it. It's such a good question. When I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, I give me a sticky note. It literally transformed my life. And so, like, for example, when you're dealing with weight loss, what would I do today if I were no longer afraid? Well, I'm going to go get a gym membership today. I never in my life had had a gym membership. I had never wanted to participate in a team sport. I had never, from grade school, I didn't want to be chosen last again. I didn't want to be laughed at. And finally, I said, you know what? If I wasn't afraid, I would today go and I'd get that gym membership and I would go back every day. I went and got my gym membership, wore my, you know, size 24 and a half uh, gym black sweats and went, got in the back row on the last treadmill possible. I could walk 15 minutes at uh, two miles an hour on a flat level. And that was it. But the difference was the next day that post-it note was still there. Yeah. And when I got up and I thought, what would I do today if I were no longer afraid? I'd go back again. And I'm not going to worry about what people think. I'm going to be my best me there is today. Yeah. And one of the things that I think I want to get down to with your transformation, you know, you were such a success, successful career woman and business owner for so long, and you dedicated so much time, energy and attention to that. And then you all of a sudden get to this point in your life where you're like, I want to make a big commitment on the health side of things. But inevitably, when you make a big commitment on the health side of things to start changing your habits, you're going to have to sacrifice some time that you had in your career and then dedicate it to your health and fitness. So talk to us a little bit about how you were able, because I think that's so oftentimes one of the biggest obstacles for people is trying to take the chunk of time that they used to do this and now do that and to be able to justify that to themselves and, and having the ability to do that for themselves. So talk to us a little bit how you were able to change your time, energy, and attention from going here to dedicating more of it to the health area of your life. Hey, well, buckle up, because I've got a lot to <laughs> say about this. And I'll say Let's it go, as Mary. fast as I can. I didn't take time for myself for 50 years. And I wore it like a badge of honor that says mm. here, hi, I only sleep four hours a night because I am like so busy with my life. And uh, I, I work 16 hours a day and I come home, I spend four hours with my family and then I collapse into bed and I get up. And I did that for 20 years and wore it like a badge of honor. And it's not. So the way that you find this time is by starting with you. I talk about this to every single person I know. You cannot give to others what you do not have yourself. You cannot work better, love your children more. You cannot be physically anything unless you fickle, fill your bucket first. There's so much talk out there right now about self-love. And I hope to shout, it's the number one thing that you can do right now for yourself. And I'm not talking about taking a bubble bath once a week or getting a massage once a month. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about every single day, listing them on your, along with your, what can I do today if I'm no longer afraid, post-it note. Those five areas that our life revolves around. And make sure you're taking care of yourself in all five areas, in your physical, in your mental, in your emotional, in your spiritual, in your social. And how is that happening? I'm not a religious person, but I am more spiritual today than I've ever been in my life. 
And that's because I began to take care of that piece of me. I just want you to start thinking about my business, my staff, my family, my clients. How is the woman who was working 18 hours a day with her family four hours a day, sleeping four hours a day, how is she able to give? Mm-hmm. I thought I was giving by not taking care of me, but there was no bucket. But the woman or man, sorry, didn't mean to be gender prejudice, but the person who fills their bucket. And for me, it started with, I am going to give myself 30 minutes. That's all. I'm just going to give myself 30 minutes. I'm going to carve out 30 minutes for me today. I became a better employer. I had more energy. I was more there for my family for decades when my family would say, hey, let's go for a hike or let's do this. Or I'd be like, oh, I'm all in until the day of. And then I would back out because I didn't have the energy or I didn't have the belief in myself that I could go and participate. When I began taking care of myself in all five areas, my bucket became so full and I began sleeping six hours a day. And when people would come in and talk to me at work and I would participate, my mind was clear. I was better. I was sharper. I didn't give up anything. By taking time for me, I blew up. I became this amazing person. And I am more ready today at age 69. I'm not giving up anything, but now I'm making sure at least an hour a day, I am taking time for me. Mm. And I'm rotating through those five areas, even though it's every day physical. I I don't ever miss on my physical. It's a process of wake up, people. You think you're sacrificing yourself so you can serve everyone else? That's the biggest lie you're telling yourself today. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. That's so good. And and I love how you talk about addressing each of the five areas on a regular basis because I think so many of us get so caught up in addressing a few of them but then leaving one or two of those buckets alone for a while and then it ends up biting us in the ass at some point. But you you just touched on it. You know, I normally would not bring up somebody's age in in a podcast, but it's really a huge part of your story, to be honest. Like now that you're, you're 69 years old, you talked about your kind of transformation starting at 50 and so many people at 40 years old, at 50 years old, think like they're on the home stretch and I'm kind of just playing it out from here and uh, I've, I've always been this way, so I'm always going to be this way. So talk about how you broke out of the mindset of like, just because I've been this way for 50 years doesn't mean I have to be this way moving forward because I think so many people hold themselves captive by th- saying this is the way it's always been, so it's the way it will always be. So how did you break out of that? We'll be back to the interview in just a second. But first, I wanted to share some words from a participant of the 10-Week Transformation. At Best You, we started running the 10WT back in January of 2020 and have since had 313 people and counting go through it. They've seen their bodies get stronger than ever before. They've seen the stubborn fat finally come off and they've seen their habits dramatically improve. And honestly, more than anything, they've seen their self-confidence skyrocket. If you want to learn more about the 10-week transformation, then you can go to nickcarrier.com slash 10WT. That's nickcarrier.com slash the number 10WT. We'll get back to the show in just a second, but first, here's what they had to say. My name is Claire, and actually, I joined the program because I met Nick at Orange Theory, and he didn't have, and I like fell in love with how he coached, you know, the energy in the class, and then he didn't have an 8 a.m., and I literally sought after this man to start an 8 a.m., and I like every single time DM'd him, like, any questions, he's like, should I do an 8 a.m.? I was responding every single time. I was like, we have to make this happen, and it is, that's just kind of, yeah, I don't know why, and then he did an 8 a.m., and I was like, Shoot, I have to join now, I guess. (laughs) I definitely would say like I've gotten a lot stronger. I have not lifted this much ever probably since I like did sports in college. Like took a break for a little while and I like definitely could see a difference of like finally actually getting back to like where I used to be. And I definitely just like have more energy throughout the day, which has just been really awesome. Oh, a favorite part of the program is um, literally just like the energy, like it's an obsession. I, uh, the energy like in his class, no matter what, is just like, 
always going, like we're always just like having fun, um, like working out can be fun, and I just think that he has found a way to be able to portray that, and I like, literally could not see like my national life without this program. You should join Nick's 10 week program. Well, I'm a huge believer in self-affirmation. I really am. And I think about all the tapes that I played for myself year after year. You're not able to do that. You aren't genetically cut out for that. And speaking of genetics, do you know what I actually found out when I actually started doing this? I had the 23 and me done. And here I thought I was just this mamsy pamsy, could never do anything physical. And then I started doing it. And then I started weight training. And I was like developing this incredible muscle mass. And when I did my 23andMe, I found out that I have an extra protein than most people have. Only 10% of the population have this extra protein that I have. No wonder I could build muscle. Mm. What if I had known that at age 13. I have been building, I have been doing everything, but I didn't know it. But I'm a huge believer in affirmations. And so when you tell yourself for so many years that you're not good at this or don't even try that, you, you know, uh, people from your, your family, you can't do this. Well, change those tapes. Mm -hmm. It can be done. Change those tapes. And I say affirmations every day now. And when I was changing them in the beginning, there were two that I used. And I'm a huge post-it note user, and I put these everywhere. And there were two. And one that I told myself every day about 20 times, it's never too late. It's mm -hmm. never too late. And the last one, the second one was, and nothing is impossible. And nothing is impossible. The only people that I had ever known that had lost over a hundred pounds and kept it off were people who had weight loss surgery. And I was not, I'm okay if that's how some people choose to do it. I just knew it wasn't for me because in doing that, I was not going to be forced into looking at the fears that had mm -hmm. brought me that weight. And so as I began this process, I just told myself all the time. It's never too late. It's never too late. And nothing is impossible. And now when I'm meeting with people, when I'm doing speaking engagements around the country, I say, if there's anybody here that believes that, afterwards, just come up and talk to me. Stand here toe-to-toe -to -toe with me at age 69, and you tell me it's too late for me. Mm -hmm. You tell me that nothing, I'm not going to be able to do that. Toe-to-toe, -to -toe, you tell me. And instead, people come up and say, you've changed my life. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's so critical. I love those two post-it notes. It's never too late and nothing is impossible. And I, I think a lot of people hear the, and nothing is impossible, but never take action like they believe it. And so taking action like you believe it is, is so critical and being reminded of yourself every single day. And I, I love how you talked about the tapes that you played in your head and the tapes that other people kind of played in your head because you do end up living out what those tapes say. And so to me, I think it's, you know, talking to yourself in the appropriate manner, but it's also getting around people who are going to also speak encouragement into you. You know, I think that's like one of the biggest things that we all got of out of Scott Miller's book launch, the other thing, like I left feeling like I got, I want to go encourage every single person who I ever interact with moving forward. I want to make sure they believe in themselves so much so that they do take action accordingly. It's so critical. Yeah. That uh, book launch was motivating because you saw so many people who started one place and changed their life. Like for example, the one guy in his book that their family didn't have anything that, that he and his brother had to take a sack lunch on the, you know, game uh, team bus and they couldn't go in and eat because the family couldn't afford it. And, and he didn't think he'd really ever amount to anything. And one day that coach or the, I guess the father of one of the other sons came in and said, Hey, nobody else has to know, but come in and sit with everybody else. I'm going to pay for your way. And that was like saying to him, I believe in you. You're yeah. worth something. And I, I want that every day. 
everyone I come in contact, when I do my weekly podcast, I want people to look at me and know that it's possible. It is. Most people look at losing 145 pounds and they think that's not even possible about weight loss surgery. Well, I hope to shout it is. It took me six years. Now, six years is not overnight. But in those, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. It's how I climbed that mountain. It's how I climbed Kilimanjaro. You know, I set that goal of 100 yards ahead. And then I would make it that far. I set the weight loss goal of 20 pounds each time. Think how many times I had to set that goal again. But when I got there, it was amazing. And you always have the summit in your in your sight. And there were times like climbing Killy, you don't have it in your sight. You just have to believe that it's up there. And you keep going just that 100 yards. But the most important piece about that summoning anything in your life, whether it's weight loss or climbing a mountain or getting a job or whatever it is, you have to watch where your feet are pointed every single step. Mm. And so you're always looking down on Killy. You're watching because you might slip and go off, you know, a 10,000 foot drop, you know, but you're watching, you're seeing, you're, you're making sure they're pointed in the right direction and that they're moving up the mountain. Every day when I was on a weight loss journey, even now when I'm still on a fitness journey and maintaining my health, I'm looking where those feet are being pointed every day. Are they pointed at eating the right things? Are they pointing at getting to the gym? Are they pointed at hiking on Saturday? Are they pointing at at golfing but not using a cart? I mean, where are those feet pointed? Okay, And not that I don't sometimes step off. But I know when I've stepped off and I get to make a choice. Do I want to pull them back on or do I just want to go on this path? Because it looks easier. The thing I've noticed, I know about those paths now is that they may look easier, but there's a cliff at the end. Yeah, that's so true. Keep moving forward. Keep making those steps every day and the summit will be yours. Mm. Oh, that reminds me. I have one more thing to say about the summit. This, I'm sorry. I get, sometimes I get so carried away with ideas. So I spent a year training to go up Killy. And it takes seven and a half days to actually summit and then a day and a half to come down. So for five and a half days, I'm doing nothing but moving forward and up and moving forward and up. And if the only thing you were doing it for was to get to the top, I spent 15 minutes on the top of killing after an, a year of training and five and a half days of climbing. If it's only about those 15 minutes of glory at the top, that's a huge waste of time. But the gift was in the journey, was in the struggle. That on Killy, I faced every fear I'd ever had. Not being enough, fear of being laughed at, fear of failure. All those fears were mine again on Killy. And one last time, I had to look them in the face and say, not today. Not today. No. That's the gift, the journey. No doubt, because, I mean, that's where transformation takes place. It's the same exact thing that you talked about with weight loss and people who had people who have lost 100 pounds from surgery, it's sure they got the outcome, but they didn't change as a person. There was no transformational thing that happened as a person because they hadn't had to form any new habits or had to confront any of the fears that they had had themselves. And same thing, if you were just helicoptered to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, then you wouldn't have actually changed as a as a person. You would be the same person just in a new location. And therefore, when you got back to the base of the mountain, you wouldn't be any different. And so it's just it's absolutely critical. And I loved what you said about when you point your feet in the wrong direction, it might not seem wrong in the beginning, but there is a cliff at some point that you're going to get to. And so I think oftentimes we take incorrect action, not seeing a direct negative consequence in the moment. And therefore we think it's not that big a deal, but we need to realize that if we compound incorrect action after incorrect action after incorrect action, then there will be a cliff at some point that 
we will potentially be stepping off of. One of the things that I think is a big part of your story, the way I kind of want to get down to it here is your relation is your relationship. You talked about your ex husband a decent amount in the book, and I know you got a, a new relationship now as well. Talk to us a little bit about what the biggest difference is in the two relationships and what makes this one so great. Uh, okay. How long do I have? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm trying. There's one big difference, and this is the biggest one. So there were lots of there are lots of them, but this is the biggest right. one. And that in my first marriage, I did nothing but hide. I hid who I was. I hid eating. I hid all my fears. Do you realize you were doing that at the time? Not, not clearly. Mm. But as I got older, I began to see it more and more and more. And that's why they call us closet eaters. Because we, we love to do it in the dark. And in my book, I say, there's a quote from, that's one of my favorite quotes of me, <laughs> favorite quote of me. <laughs> and it is this, that the healing st- starts when the hiding stops. Mm-hmm. And when the healing finally, the, the hiding finally stops, you can begin to heal. And that's the biggest difference between my relationship now and my relationship in my first marriage is I'm no longer hiding. I think I could tell John just about anything. And I have a surety. I feel it at such deep levels that he was going to love me anyway. Mm. And that he's no longer hiding. He, His late wife passed away five years ago. And it wasn't until he was in this mar- this relationship that he realized, hey, I had been hiding. And I thought that relationship was okay until I found out what it was like to be in a relationship where you are willing to be emotionally naked in front of each other. So the first time I said to him, hey, do you want to get naked? <laughs> he was like, uh, well, uh. <laughs> like <That's> today. <laughs> I go, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about physically naked. I'm talking about emotionally naked where we share something with each other that maybe we haven't ever shared before. And we stepped into that space. That's cool. And found that kind of bond. And we've been stepping into it every day since. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to look with a long list. Well, let's see, I want somebody who has this and somebody who's this and somebody who likes this and this. This is the biggest key to a great relationship. Find somebody that you're willing to get naked with and that wants to get naked with you physically, maybe, but always emotionally. Emotionally, just be vulnerable. That's the first step, you know, in the pendulum from living a fear based life to living a love based life. Mm -hmm. There's a passageway that we all must pass through if we're going to have this. I don't know all the steps in there. But I do know the first one, the first step into the passageway from fear to love is the willingness to be vulnerable. And all these years, I thought if I let my real self out, no one would love me. And when I found out was all that that person that I'd been hiding all these years was the part people loved about me. (laughs) It's great. Yeah, that's awesome. That's powerful stuff. I think that the I think I really think that's a cool conversation i know joked about it a little bit but are you ready to get emotionally naked and and i think that's like a for some reason that i feel like that sparks vulnerability very well and, and anyways i think that was just so great i think that's really cool and uh it's yeah it's so great that you guys both have found a relationship that you feel comfortable to really open up with at, at this point at this point so but anyways before i ask the last question mary i just want to acknowledge you you know ever since I remember Scott talking about how you always were there for other people and that everybody can learn something from you about relationships. But then for you to today be the type of person who says that you need to fill your own cup up first so that 
you can serve others at a high level. I think that's such a powerful message that all of us need to be frequently reminded of. It's like, yes, we need to be generous for others. Yes, we need to show up for others, but we have to, in order to show up for others well, we have to show up for ourselves first, and we have to be able to be the best version of ourselves first so that we can actually be selfless in the way that we want to be for other people. And so I want to acknowledge you for being able to do that at at such a high level and your transformation over the last couple of decades is super inspiring, and I know it will be for many others as well. Thank you. Uh, that's what it's all about for me now. Uh, yeah. Every day I think, how, what am I going to do to lift myself today? And then what am I going to do for others to lift them? Boom. And they go hand in hand. Good one-two punch right there. That's a good one-two punch right there. You guys need to make sure you go. I know you're fired up from listening to this interview. You guys need to make sure you go get Mary's new book, Unbounded from sorrow to summit where you get a lot more insight into her transformation, a lot more insight into some of her hiking stories. And it is really just powerful stuff with some motivating quotes, with some practical advice. And so make sure you go get unbounded from sorrow to summit. Also make sure you follow Mary on Instagram at Mary crafts, and you can go to her website at Mary crafts, uh, That's Mary crafts, Inc. I N C. I've had people yes. go like ink, like I N K. <laughs> like I'm a tattoo artist. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Crafts Inc. And there are links there to buy my book as well. On Amazon, you do have to put my last name in because there are other people who have Unbounded. But if you put Unbounded, and you don't even have to put Sorrow, sorrow to Summit, Unbounded, Mary Crafts. So it's kind of like Arts and Crafts with a C and an S on the end. Crafts, Arts and Crafts. In fact, I always wanted to name one of my sons Arts and <laughs> never did though that was just a wicked trick and i and i did never do that but that's, that's how funny. i get people to remember is i just say it's like like arts and crafts <laughs> that's hilarious that would be that would be pretty darn, pretty darn funny um all right well awesome i know people are gonna go uh go and hop on and, and get a copy but last question here mary is that i think getting closer to the best version of yourself is a constant journey i think we're always continually working to get better and better and i also believe it's a unique journey uh so for you personally if there are three things that you could currently do or currently work on to get closer to the best version of Mary Crafts that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Okay. That's a little tricky, Chris, but I think I have the answers for you. I totally am on the page, but there's never an end to this journey. Sometimes I joke when I'm at the gym and, and as I leave, I go, wow, how old do I have to be to quit coming here? And they always do this thing back to me. Never, you never quit. (laughs) And, but I just, I joke with that because it is an ongoing process. Even at my age, I'm still going to the gym five days a week. And the other two days I'm doing something out of the gym. We don't go to the gym just so we get to go to the gym. We go to the gym so we get to do other things. And Mm -hmm. that's the best part of it. Like this summer, um, I'm learning how to play pickleball for the first time and uh, took up the um, sport of golf, which I never thought I would do. But I know for me, there are so many other things out there that I still yet want to do physically. I still want to climb another mountain. So those that's one piece out there for me is to continue to expand my experiences in the realm of health and fitness because experiences never end. The other thing for me is I want to take more time in meditation. People say, is that like prayer? And this is always my response. Prayer is when you're just asking, hey, help me with this. Give me this. I want this. Don't forget to help this. That's asking. Meditation is when you listen for the answers. I've had so many answers given to me when I've been taking the time to go in deep meditation. And at this point in my life, that's even more valuable to me. It helps me physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, socially, all those things by spending more time with me and the universe. So that's the other thing. And the third thing is that I'm always striving more for is that in the end, Nick, the most important piece in my life will always be 
my greatest legacy, which is my family, my children, my grandchildren, John. And to always remember every day, and I, and I want to make sure that I'm always thinking this in my mind every day, do my actions meet what I say is the most important to me? Mm. Or am I doing all these other things? And when I have time, then there's my family, my children, my grandchildren, and John. Or do I start with them and then have time for everything else over here? So those are three things that I'm continually now working on. And I don't know if you know this about me, but I have every intention of living until I'm 105 with an option to renew. And it allows me to have all the time I need to accomplish everything that I'm meant to in this life. That's good. That's super inspiring, Mary. I know everybody is fired up. I think it's just so great that there's few people as motivated as you are to still accomplish so much. And again, I'm not saying that you're old, but people who are your age aren't typically as motivated to continue to accomplish so much and write their first book. It's it's just so cool. So you guys make sure you guys go grab a copy of Unbounded from Sorrow to Summit. But Mary, that was awesome today. That's all we got. Okay, thank you so much. Namaste.